and chemical weapons. Today, we have joined for this 10th session under the aegis of Dr. Vishwanath Karad, MIT World Peace University, organized by MIT School of Government, Bharatiya Chhatra Sansad, and supported by UNESCO Chair. My friends, we all have gathered here to discuss the very, very important topic of this session, role of United Nations in eliminating the weapons of mass destruction, priorities and prospects from the eyes of the youth. And indeed, uh, uh, this very important topic would be discussed by the eminent speakers. We would, have, we would be having soon with us Advocate Salman Khurshidji, the senior advocate, former Union Minister for External Affairs, Law and Justice, Minority Affairs, Government of India. We, we do have with us uh, Sri Arvind Guptashi. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Uh, Director of Vivekananda International Foundation. We also have with us the President of International Council for Control of Iodine Deficiencies Disorder, ICCIDT, and former Professor of Ames, New Delhi, Dr. Chandrakan Pandavji. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. And now, with the permission of the Chair, I would like to begin with this session. But uh, before we start, as for the tradition of every session, we request the moderator of this session to give the introductory remarks. And today we have with us the head of School of Design of MIT World Peace University, Dr. Suman Deva Dolaji, as the moderator of this session. Uh, without taking any further time, I request him to kindly open this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Bapat. Good afternoon, everybody. I extend a warm welcome to the distinguished panelists, former Union Minister Salman Kurshidji, the Director for Vivekananda International Foundation, Arvind Guptaji, and the President for International Council on Control of Iodine Deficiency Disorders, Dr. Chandrakant Pandavji, and the dignified audience attending this webinar. It is my privilege to be moderating this important session on the role of UN in eliminating weapons of mass destruction from the perspective of youth. The eeriness and anxious times that this pandemic has forced us into reminds me of the world wars. Both the world wars saw the allied forces emerging victorious over the central and axis forces respectively. The world war I saw almost as many civilians die as did the military on either sides. However, during the world war II, with 45 million civilian deaths, this grew to thrice the number of military deaths on either sides. Consequently, millions of youth are left or were left without support and directionless when they needed it the most. Quite appropriately then, the League of Nations has become United Nations with an agenda for humanity and youth now, with the International Youth Year declared in 1985, along with a bold program of action for youth. However, with the biological and chemical weapons as weapons of mass destruction that the belligerent nations could develop and use recently in Syria and other places, the emphasis or the threat to humanity is looming, kills many people silently without the use of force and leaves many, many more people with debilitating conditions that prevent them from leading a productive life. It is unfortunate that youth are a significant part of this affected population. I should also add that there is no universally agreed international definition of the youth age group. But for statistical purposes, however, the United Nations, without prejudice to any other definitions made by the member states, defines youth as those persons between age 15 and 24 years. So for now, we might consider that the millennials and the Generation Z or Z, groups of people largely fall under the youth category right now. During this crucial time of theirs, youth pick up education that determines their profession, careers, and start earning to support many others lead their lives similarly. The particular sustainable development goals in question hence are sustainable development goal four and eight. And these are particular interest to youth. Youths are agents of change and drive sustainable growth when guided rightfully. And hence, it has to be ensured institutionally that they are not affected due to the influences, of, influences or reasons outside their purview. Destructions that spans generations 
also binds them responsibly. The intra and intergenerational responsibility in question as part of this session of the international conference is that of the perpetrating generation as well as that, the, that of the generation that is also party to the consequences of biological weapons of mass destruction as well as chemical weapons. Quite appropriately then the 74th session of the General Assembly on its agenda item 98 has passed a resolution on the youth for disarmament and non-proliferation. Coincidentally, this is around the same time the pandemic has started. Resolution was passed on 12th uh, December 2019. And this becomes a context for us. Hence, I urge the panel to view eradication of biological and chemical weapons as weapons of mass destruction and share their views on the priorities and prospects for youth as part of the role of UN in eliminating weapons of mass destruction, particularly from the commitment of the parties of the UN, whether they are signatory, non-signatory, whether they have acceded, succeeded, ratified, not ratified conventions, and different control terms of arms. We talk in terms of arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation, eradication, etc. With this, we are keen to hear the views and opinions of the distinguished panelists on priorities and prospects that youth should have on the role of UN in eliminating WMDs. Over to you, Professor Babbitt. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suman. Thank you very much uh, for your introductory remarks. And now it's time that uh, we move forward in this session. As the theme of this session is role of United Nations in eliminating weapons of mass destruction, priorities, prospects, and from the eyes of youth. Indeed, Dr. Suman explained to us that what exactly is the need to discuss this particular topic. But let's see from the uh, from the technology's uh, perspective. Let's. Uh, I request my technical team if they could please uh, relay the film made on this particular thing. COVID-19 has imposed heavy costs on humanity in multiple dimensions. It's high time that we take a stock of prominent things and global governing bodies impacting new world order. Let us study the role of United Nations in eliminating weapons of mass destruction on priorities and prospects from the eyes of youth at International Conference on Eradication of Biological and Chemical Weapons. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, for that uh, visual. And indeed, it is, uh, it is important for us to understand and discuss every topic uh, of this uh, conference. Because somewhere, every topic that is being discussed is connected to us. Uh, yesterday, we saw in our discussion that uh, some of us are really scared that are we really sitting uh, like ducks and where somebody comes uh, from somewhere and uh, uses the weapons of mass destruction against us. Uh, but anyways, uh, let's let's move forward. And we are, it is indeed our honor and privilege that uh, Salman Kurfiji has joined us now. I yes, uh, request everyone to uh, put on their cameras so that we can capture this uh, movement. I request uh, Chandrakant Pandavji, uh, yeah, he's already there, Deepak Apteji, if you could please uh, switch on your camera so that we can capture this uh, memorable photograph. Well, as I've been saying that we don't see cameramen running around uh, in this uh, webinar format. Let's get used to this new novel. Thank you very much. Uh, I request my technical team to let me know once uh, the moment is captured. Sir, it's done. Done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, your smiles. Uh, let's, uh, it is indeed my honor and privilege to move on. And uh, as uh, we have already joined by our first uh, eminent speaker of this session, Salman Khurshidji, and it is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce him to all of you. Uh, Shri Salman Khurshidji, uh, born on 1st of January 1953, uh, is an Indian politician, uh, designated senior advocate, eminent author, and the law teacher. 
He was the cabinet minister of the Ministry of External Affairs and he belongs to the Indian National Congress. He's a lawyer and he's a writer who has been elected from the Farukhabad Lok Sabha constituency in the general elections of year 2009. He belongs to the Farukhabad area. Prior to this, uh, he was also elected for the 10th Lok Sabha from the Farukhabad Lok Sabha constituency and became the Union Deputy Minister of Commerce in June 1991 and later became the Union Minister of State for External Affairs. Sarmanji started his political career as an officer on special duty in the Prime Minister's office during the Prime Ministership of Indira Gandhiji in early 1980s. Later, he became the Deputy Minister of Commerce in the Government of India. In 1991, he won the election to the Parliament from the Farukhabad Lok Sabha constituency in Uttar Pradesh and was appointed as the Minister of the State for External Affairs by the Prime Minister Narsimha Rao. He was the Union Minister of State with independent charge of corporate affairs and the Ministry of Air, Minority Affairs in the Government of India. He took over as Minister on Friday 29th, May 2009 in the Cabinet reshuffle on 12th July 2011 and was made the Cabinet Minister for Law and Justice and for Minority Affairs in the Government of India. So Kurshidji has been deeply involved in writing and acting in plays since his student days in Delhi and Oxford. He is the author of the play Son of Babur, published by Rupa and Company. It is indeed our honor and privilege, sir, to have you here today with us to discuss such an important topic with us. My friends, let me share with you that uh, Kurshidji, because of his uh, busy schedule, would be leaving uh, after his speech, but we would not let him go without he answers some of our viewers' questions. So I request everyone to post their questions immediately after his speech, uh, and we would be taking questions and answers for him right after his speech. So I request everyone in the audience to post their questions and answer questions in the Q&A box only. Please do not post your questions in the chat box. And now, without taking much time, I hand over the charge to Salman Khurshidji. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Salman. So your mic is mute. Could you please unmute yourself? Sir, your mic is mute. Yeah. Okay, is it, is it okay Yes, now? yes, can absolutely. We can hear you. Right. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. These are technology technology issues that uh, that have the better better of us. I'm just trying to get get to a point where I don't run out of run out of batteries. So uh, We've, we've had a full day. It's been a, a day full of, uh, uh, full of uh, legal conferences and, and, uh, and other, uh, other events that I will do on, online. But you were very, uh, yours was a very important event and I thought that I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't uh, miss this event um, for its significance and its importance that uh, it obviously it obviously has so uh, uh, with uh, advance uh, apology for leaving early so that i can get on to the other webinar on law um, but i will hopefully be able to say a few things to you that i believe are important uh, i think that uh, when when we look at the role for youth and the importance of youth in nuclear disarmament we are really referring to referring to the responsibility that our generation has and indeed generations that have passed uh, uh, had to the pass the torch to a new generation which was uh, in terms of its destiny and its future secure today of course there are a huge number of of uh, issues that hang over our head um, immediate concern now is how will the world come out of this horrible horrible pandemic of covid 19 before this there were there were issues uh, such as the threat of global terrorism uh, which diverted our attention from what has been a sustained concern about the threat to the world of uh, what could happen with a, a nuclear holocaust now we all know uh, that there were some really really tragic things that happened in the world when 
when the first nuclear weapons were dropped uh, in, on the 6th of August, 1945, the little boy dropped on, on Hiroshima. And then uh, 9th of August, 1945, Fat Man dropped over Nagasaki. And from that very moment, from that very moment, the world began to think seriously about how horrible the outcome are and how terrible we will be if we continue to proceed along the path of nuclear weapons. But of course, despite the concerns first expressed in, of all places, in Japan, which were, uh, they were the people who were the receiving end of the worst things that could have happened with the, uh, with the use of nuclear weapons. But subsequently, the movement caught the attention of an enormous number of people, many of them are very, very important, significant intellectuals, but also relatively young people at that time who said that we were going along the wrong path. And therefore, world opinion began to be, began to be, to be created and began to be consolidated against the, first, the use of nuclear weapons, uh, the, then the, the uh, reduction of nuclear weapons, and finally, to try and aim for, for uh, complete eradication of nuclear weapons. But when I say that, the, and when you look at in your, in your uh, webinar, when you look at the importance of youth here, the uh, UN itself has, has recognized under the, the UN ODA that the youth have a special responsibility and they provided a platform where youth can work towards elimination of nuclear weapons. But frankly, the youth really are important not just for the energy and the, and the engagement and the participation and the, the importance of a young generation everywhere, as we know uh, in our own country, but also particularly because it's about them. This armament is about them and their future. The world they inherit tomorrow, the world in which they have to live and survive, and the world that they then have to hand over to their succeeding generations, uh, they become the pivot, as it were, the most significant uh, significant participants in this entire approach for nuclear dis disarmament. And therefore, I believe that you've done a human service by focusing on how young people can work towards disarmament. But you know, it's a, it's a larger ethos. It's not only about nuclear weapons. You have to think about peace. You have to think about the opposite of peace, which is, which is war. Uh, you have to look at life and the opposite of life, which is death. And the sensitivity that we develop amongst our young people about how important life is and that passing transitory passions, which talk about bringing about death or killing people is not what has a lasting value, but preservation and security has a lasting value. That for us to be able to fight disease and give people a good life is more important than our being able to show that with the strength of weapons and with the strength and bellicosity of our attitudes, we can destroy people and start to dominate other civilizations because we are more powerful. Now, I think uh, this is something that, that uh, returns to haunt people or to question and challenge them as it has happened in our country of late. Um, living in peace for a while with a neighboring country and suddenly we find that our relations sour and some disagreements, some difference of perception if we often call it, and some reason for distrust between neighbors who should be living in peace and who indeed were living in peace for, for donkeys of years uh, from 75 if we didn't have uh, a, a, a fatal casualty on the border with our neighbor, uh, why should that suddenly have turned into a gruesome, sad tragedy 
of 20 of our brave men being uh, slaughtered in the defense of the country. But it can't be that you're against nuclear weapons, but you're not against weapons per se. But obviously, it can't be that weapons be completely eliminated. Therefore, control on weapons, restriction on weapons, care about use of weapons, but weapons that are of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, elimination of those weapons being in extremely important. Now, we all know, and I, 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 I'm very, very uh, uh, conscious of the fact that some very good experts are going to be addressing you after I've finished. But if you look at quickly at how the world has gathered its steam, as it were, to try and put some brakes on, on uh, nuclear weapons, the initial period of the attempts were to prevent uh, the, the testing of nuclear weapons. First, they were tested, uh, tested uh, underwater, uh, and we do know the implications for that for for a long period. They were then tested uh, under uh, uh, underground, and we do know the implications in some cases where those tests have gone wrong, and there have been escape of of uh, uh, nuclear fumes from underground tests as well. But gradually, we have seen from 1987, the INF Treaty, uh, then in the 1991, START 1, 2003, the Strategic Offensive Reduction Treaty, 2010, the new START Treaty. There, the attempt was twofold. Uh, in, one, in one stream, attempts were being made that the testing be stopped, the testing be prevented, and certainly the proliferation must be prevented so that new nuclear powers don't come into existence. Now, there is an area in which um, there is some difficulty with the, the NPT and the CTBT, where India had uh, uh, an issue about the, uh, the, uh, the, lack, of, the lack of parity that was provided, and India therefore became an exception to members uh, who, were, who were nuclear party members of the NPT. Now, that's a very special area, but the overall approach that India has had has been for elimination of nuclear weapons, and this was, this was crowned in 1988, 9th of June 1988, India's attempt at, at uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons were, uh, were brought to a high pitch when a very young Indian Prime Minister, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, appeared before the UN and spoke of the nuclear, weapon-free, and non-violent world order. That was the high point. Of course, uh, that remains, as it were, the touchstone of what is possible, what we will hopefully achieve one day. But our attention, I think, world over has drifted away from nuclear weapons, but not before we were able to put some, some, uh, for some control, as it were, both in terms of proliferation, in terms of testing, and in terms of the number of weapons by massive effort by both Russia at, uh, at that time, USSR at that time, and the uh, United States, bringing the totality of their weapons down and putting some restriction on the delivery systems, the missile systems by which nuclear weapons are delivered. They are, of course, delivered by aircraft as well, and that is true about the Indian forces as well, that we have, we have the ability to deliver to the Air Force by air, we have an ability to deliver through missiles. We have an ability to, to deliver from, from the sea through, uh, through submarines. Now, that's uh, uh, the totality of things that are available to countries like China, the uh, countries, as I, as I believe, like Israel, uh, countries, countries like, like Pakistan, uh, and, of course, the, the uh, original uh, five um, members of the of the nuclear club. So, as I said, we have drifted to looking at other challenges that have come, 
but nuclear elimination of nuclear weapons has never been never been relegated to an unimportant position there is uh, world over there is a constant attention and and uh, uh, a constant effort to ensure that we continue to address and in between uh, when the world was concerned about about uh, the uh, terrorist groups that were globally uh, holding the world to ransom uh, and we saw some of those terrible events happen in the country including in the world including 9-11 at that point another very serious concern emerged and that concern was both of dirty weapons i.e people being able to to uh, manufacture weapons in situations in which they are called dirty weapons and of course uh, the terrorists getting their hands onto nuclear arsenals uh, and that was a serious concern in, in the thinking both of the united states of america and the ussr or russia uh, as a successor state but it's a concern equally of countries like india and and, and the, the rest of the world uh, so this is basically the landscape the 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 uh, very very uh, roughly the situation where we are today um, we are in a much better situation than we were perhaps 20 years ago at the end of the cold war uh, we began seriously thinking about why should we have all these weapons and countries began to began to accommodate and adjust as it were their past ambitions to be stronger and stronger and the the uh, uncontrolled uncontrolled proliferation of, of weapons began to be checked but as we said and i dedicate this to the future uh, young people of the world tomorrow that uh, we give to them a safe world when will this actually happen that we will be able to eliminate nuclear weapons is difficult for anyone to predict there's not just the issue of strategic weapons but there's also the issue of tactical weapons that we often consider where uh, in ordinary ordinary conventional war nuclear weapons for uh, of of uh, low capacity and nuclear weapons of uh, 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 of uh, marginal impact in in the battlefield uh, could change the very nature of conventional battle but that's again a point of view that uh, a lot of people believe requires much greater attention and uh, we hope that the world will remain focused on the issue of elimination of these weapons. Greatest threat to humanity must be brought to an end. Uh, and I say that without exception to and, and without uh, undermining or, or diluting the impact of disease or the, or the impact of terrorism on our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your words of wisdom. Uh, but uh, we would request you, as I said, we will not let you go unless you answer a couple of questions of uh, our participants. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So the first question uh, to you is coming from Mr. Vijay Nadgar, and he would like to ask, sir, what in your opinion should we as Indians do to impress the world leaders to eradicate weapons of mass destruction? Over to you, sir. See, this is a difficult question. and. Uh... I've, I've had to think about this when I've been in government. Uh, the responsibility that government places on your shoulders, uh, they need to be fully prepared for any, any uh, possible outcome uh, in the neighborhood. We are uh, in a very, very tricky neighborhood uh, when it comes to nuclear weapons. Pakistan has nuclear weapons, and of course, China has nuclear weapons much more in numbers than we have uh, and therefore therefore anyone might ask that committed to elimination of nuclear weapons what is it that we have done have we uh, we couldn't hold back from from uh, weaponizing our nuclear uh, our nuclear technology uh, because uh, and that was fortunate because within days of our uh, reaching that particular level Pakistan also exploded its its nuclear devices, and therefore, uh, uh, let us just say that we may have had a little pre-science of what was likely to happen. We knew um, 
how much assistance they were getting from other neighbors uh, in preparation of their nuclear program. But uh, having said that, uh, when we speak in the world, people could ask, what are you doing about reduction of weapons in your region? Uh, and that makes it very, very, very difficult for us to be able to argue a case for elimination when we cannot, uh, honestly cannot take any steps towards elimination at home because that would require very serious uh, uh, thought to be given and, and effort to be made both with Pakistan and with China. So uh, our intentions are, are very good. And I believe that we have the, we have the best credentials for speaking about, uh, about uh, elimination of nuclear weapons. Our nuclear non-first use nuclear doctrine, uh, that is something that has been appreciated in the world. And uh, we have to wait for the right time, perhaps in the right uh, situation to be able to push this thing further. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, quick two more questions. Uh, uh, the question is coming from Soumya, and she asks, Sir, do you think that the United Nations is a bit biased towards the superpowers like United States? Do you think this needs to be solved uh, in order to uh, uh, have better efficiency in eradication of weapons? Well, uh, for eradication of weapons, perhaps yes, but in the, the overall governance model of the United Nations, the world accepts that the, uh, the conditions that applied in 1945 have uh, changed uh, very radically since 1945, and that the, the reform of the United Nations is long overdue. Everybody accepts that a reformed Security Council would inevitably have India as a permanent member. The only, the only uh, difference of opinion that still remains is whether the expanded permanent membership would also have the veto, which is of a very special nature going back to 1945 in the world as it stood in 1945. So uh, a better uh, reflection of what the world is today in a reformed United Nations, which uh, would be focused on, on a uh, reformed Security Council or a larger uh, Security Council with more permanent members is, it is the need of the hour. And uh, hopefully uh, that will be also a very significant contribution towards uh, putting in more energies towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. Thank you, sir. One quick uh, last questions, uh, question. Do you think that strict actions like boycott, financial restrictions, etc., would play an important role as punishment for the defaulters? Well, uh, you know, we've suffered that. Uh, don't forget that, uh, that, that we exploded our devices in Pakistan. Uh, there was the first reaction was to tone down trade with India and, and impose certain restrictions on India, etc. Uh, but we argued the case. We argued that it was a very, very compelling uh, circumstances in which to protect ourselves and our people. We had to do that. And fortunately, the world, the world appreciated that we had our, uh, our new nuclear, uh, civil nuclear agreement with the United States of America. There was a major breakthrough in the way which, in, in the, way which the, the uh, nuclear powers used to approach uh, countries like India. And uh, there, uh, you know, uh, India stood firm, uh, took the shock of, uh, of first the the negative attitudes that we had to suffer, but gradually worked our way through so that we could persuade people that that's not the right thing to do. But uh, so it sounds awkward if I say that, look, uh, it was wrong for the boycotts to be imposed on us or restrictions to be imposed on us. Um, but if somebody else goes for nuclear weapons, uh, it should be utilized against them. Uh, I think that we have to see things in the context in which we were, uh, and also the size of India and the, the important need for India to be part of the nuclear club. We still aren't really fully members of the nuclear club uh, because a very artificial distinction is made between those that had weapons before 
NPT and those who now have weapons, which is uh, which includes India. But of course, the hyphenization with Pakistan is what creates uh, a problem for people being able to accept our arguments fully and entirely. But we've come a long way. We've come a long way. And I think that uh, if we concentrate on reversing the cycle, i.e. reversing the process of expansion of countries getting nuclear weapons, we would be uh, in, a, in a happy place. Uh, I think we should acknowledge that South, Southern South Africa, uh, at the time of its independence, although the decision was taken by the previous regime, but uh, President Nelson Mandela could easily have reversed that decision and kept the nuclear weapons that he could, have, he could then have made. But he didn't. And I think we must acknowledge that as a major contribution to peace effort and to uh, elimination of nuclear weapons. And I hope we'll all have the strength one day to be able to do what Mandela did. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for joining in. On behalf of entire everyone at MIT World Peace University, our beloved founder, Professor Dr. Vishwanath Karatsa, who is currently with us, our executive president, Sri Rahul Karatsa. We thank you very much for joining us and taking time out from your busy schedule today and joining us. So thank you, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I had to leave early, but uh, at least uh, it's better than not having come at all. And uh, good luck thank to you, you, and I hope we'll meet again sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now it is uh, indeed my... Uh, it is, it is uh, uh, been the tradition of this conference that we have been understanding the views of the young, young and the, I would say citizens of our country. And today we have with us uh, Jasmine Mehta, uh, who would like to share her views on this important topic. So without taking much time, Jasmine, we have limited time. Please be crisp and uh, let us know what you want to say. Over to you, Jasmine. Thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity. Hello, everyone. On the role of United Nations in eliminating the weapons of mass destruction of mass destruction is both timely and challenging. Although the Cold War is over and the super tensions have diminished greatly, the threat posed by the weapons of mass destruction has not disappeared. In fact, the enduring presence of nuclear, chemical weapons continue to threaten the whole society. The UN's founder hoped that the maintenance of international peace and security would lead to control and eventual reduction of weapons. Therefore, the Charta empowers the General Assembly to consider principles for the arms and control and disarmament to make recommendations to member states and security council, giving it also the responsibility to formulate plans. Although the goals of arms control and disarmament has proved elusive, the UN has facilitated the creation of several multilateral arms control treaties because with the development of atomic bombs atomic bomb during the World War II. As we all know that the attack on the Pearl Harbor in US by Japan was a disaster, which caused massive destruction and loss of precious human lives. And America, in its retaliation, also detonated two nuclear weapons over the Japanese cities in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The destruction of the overwhelming chaos had made orderly counting impossible and it was more devastating than the attack by Japan. These attacks sort of brought a cold wave and terror among people, and this fear was far more worse than the destruction. The wild culmination of all these attacks compelled the UN to take a strict action against the use of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. In this regard, in June 1998, the Assembly approved a treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, which banned the spread of nuclear weapons. This treaty represented a significant commitment on the part where more than 185 significant of signatory powers to engage into a pact, not developing and not either deploying nuclear weapons. 
So many nuclear countries, including Argentina, Brazil, Egypt, Israel, Pakistan, and South Africa, signed the treaty in 1991. And as all we know, that the UN has been promoting and attempting to eliminate all these weapons of mass destruction, like the biological weapons, and the convention prohibiting the managing, manufacturing, stockpiling, and use of biological weapons was approved by the assembly in 1991. And also in the same manner, the chemical weapons convention 1993 also prohibited the development, production, stockpiling, and use of chemical weapons. In 1996, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited the testing of nuclear weapons from the above, he concluded that UN has played a very significant role in eliminating weapons, causing most destruction. But contradictory to this, we find that many nations defy the UN Council by developing, testing, keeping the harmful weapons either nuclear, biological, chemical. The nations like the United States, Iran, have violated the treaties it signed with the UN. Like the recent case of Jan, Jan 7th on 2020, like we have seen that Iran launched a coordinated ballistic missile strike against the US assets in the Iraq, causing mass destruction and developing weapons of mass destruction. So the countries like them have been developing these weapons of mass destruction to signify their power and presence in the global world. And this approach has resulted in the destruction of human lives and global right. peace. I strongly appeal that countries should coordinate and cooperate with the United Nations so that it can establish global peace and save human precious lives. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Jasmine. Thank you very much for bringing those thoughts on table. Thank you very much for sharing with everyone here. My friends, it is indeed my honor and privilege thank you, to uh, take this conference uh, to our next eminent speaker, Sri Arvind Kuptaji, and it is indeed my honor and privilege uh, to introduce him to all of you. Dr. Arvind Gupta, the director of Vivekanand International Foundation, is the Indian Foreign Service uh, Officer, former uh, Deputy National Secretary Advisor, and Secretary to National Security Council Secretariat and Joint Secretary of NSCS on the deputation from Ministry of External Affairs 1999 to 2007. He dealt with a wide range of national security issues with the NSC structure, had wide ranging interaction in official uh, capacity with delegations of other countries. The former Director General Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis, IDSA, and is Lal Bahadur Shastri Chair for National Security from 2008 to 2011. He conducted track two level interactions with the think tanks of other countries. IDSA is entirely founded by the Ministry of Defense, served in Indian diploma, uh, diplomatic missions in Moscow, London, and Ankara, dealt with Afghanistan, Kashmir, Soviet Union, Russia, and Central Asia in the, in the Ministry of External Affairs is MSc Physics from Delhi University, a visiting member of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, MPhil, and PhD from School of International Studies, JNU. He's interested in the problems of the national and international security, foreign policy, issues of different strategy, ancient Indian thoughts, nation building, science and technology, etc. He has also written four books and co-edited several. Sir, it is indeed our honor and privilege to have you here today with us. Thank you very much for joining in. And without taking any further time, I hand over the control to you. Over to you, sir. The invitation to me uh, to speak at this important conference came two, three days ago. And uh, since I was busy with many other things, so I'm afraid I'm not organized my thoughts too well, but I'll share some of uh, uh, you know, some my views on some of the things that have already been said. And but I want to congratulate uh, all of you for uh, focusing on a very important subject, uh, which uh, has been current uh, since the invention of uh, nuclear technologies. 
uh, going back to the 1945 uh, dropping of the Hirosh bombs on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, etc. Uh, the UN, as uh, Jasmine Klein said, uh, has played a very important role, and it still has an important role. Uh, but the fact remains that uh, the weapons of mass destruction have not been eliminated. And I think we need to look at the reasons why it is so. Uh, and maybe I'll touch upon some of these uh, uh, issues uh, as I go along. Firstly, could you tell me how many minutes do I have? Sir, uh, you have uh, 15 to 20 minutes, sir. 15 to 20 minutes, okay. Let me uh, begin by... Uh, this is the 75th year of the UN, and uh, it's a very important uh, anniversary. Uh, the charter of the UN was more or less decided by the victors in June of 1945. And this structure of permanent five and uh, veto uh, powers, this was decided even before the UN came into existence. So this was June 1945, and as you know, UN talks about uh, uh, peace and international cooperation, and it's a lofty charter, uh, which came into being in uh, September of 1945. But let's not forget, between after June, it was in August that the, Hirosh the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you could see two tendencies. One tendency, that we should eliminate war, or we should eliminate the reasons for the war, we should forge uh, uh, international cooperation. And that is what the UN has done uh, all these years. But there was the other tendency that weapons are still very important. And the first use of weapons of mass destruction just a few months before uh, the establishment of the uh, UN itself. So just uh, uh, something to uh, ponder over. And these two tendencies to maintain national security, to maintain uh, your own uh, security at a national level, you need uh, to have weapons. And this other tendency that we should have international cooperation uh, and uh, solve the resolve the global issues, that's another tendency. So there is always a struggle between the, the two uh, tendencies. It's as if they are the two sides of the same coin. So when we say that uh, we have not been able to eliminate the weapons of mass destruction, the answer lies, why? The answer lies in the uh, fact that the world is anarchic. It's a very realist world. And in the end, it is not the international cooperation, but it is the national uh, survival that is the most important. So, so long as people feel insecure, and there are many reasons for feeling insecure, they will continue to take resort to weapons. And nuclear weapon, in a sense, is an equalizer. You cannot have a large uh, uh, conventional force, so you have a nuclear weapon. And you can see how North Korea, for instance, plays on this fear. So they have nothing, they're starving, but they have the nuclear weapons. You look at Iran, from their point of view, they are facing a number of security uh, issues. So they continue to develop, even clandestinely, the nuclear weapons, although they were part of the JCPOA. But uh, they say that uh, because the Americans left it, so they are you now coming back to the, uh, you know, uh, starting the centrifuges, et cetera. The Rajiv Gandhi action plan was mentioned by Mr. Sulman Khrushchev. If you look at that action plan, it was a very comprehensive action plan which talked about a phased elimination of the nuclear weapons. But what went wrong? It talked about disarmament, it talked about uh, nuclear, it talked about space weapons, it talked about emerging technologies, it talked about uh, uh, conventional uh, forces, and it gave a certain phases. In phase one, you should do this, phase two, you should do this, phase three, you but it was completely and totally ignored by the international community. Why? Because in the uh, 80, 88, when this uh, plan was uh, given, the Cold War was uh, coming to an end. A few years later, the uh, Soviet Union uh, disappeared. 
and a unipolar world came and you had uh, a totally new security environment. And the result was that India at that point of time was not strong enough to, uh, you could give the idea, but how do you implement it? So the program, the plan was considered to be a very uh, utopian. In fact, just a few years ago, there was another attempt by India when an informal group was set up during the UPA government on RGAP, Rajiv Gandhi Action Plan 2. And it's, uh, in fact, I've got a, a copy of uh, that here. And this one uh, reiterated the, what was said in uh, the uh, 1988 plan. It gave certain, uh, by this time we had become nuclear. It gave certain uh, uh, recommendations, but again, nothing much uh, has happened. And now we have additional uh, complication, and that is of the non-state actors. So the WMD technologies falling into the hands of non-state actors is a very serious issue. So I think so long as the world remains uh, insecure or there is a reasons for insecurity, complete elimination of nuclear weapons is very difficult. The second point is, Jasmine mentioned a number of uh, treaties, and I think uh, it was a heroic task that these treaties uh, could be, uh, uh, you know, first a consensus could be built and uh, then uh, they could be implemented. But one of the treaties at least, and the most important one, the NPT, was deeply flawed. Why was it deeply flawed? Because it created a category of those privileged countries who could continue to have their nuclear weapons. And it created a category of those countries who could not have nuclear weapons. And that is the reason why India did not join the treaty. And this flaw was made permanent when the treaty itself in 1995 was made a permanent treaty. So now you have a nuclear uh, non-proliferation regime, which is based on a deeply flawed assumption of uh, uh, nuclear haves and nuclear have-nots. So why should nuclear have-nots continue to suffer uh, the dadagiri of nuclear haves? I mean, I'm just using that word to just make a point. So you have a very deeply flawed treaty. You have a nuclear uh, biological weapons uh, convention, very good, but no verification uh, arrangement there. I think out of the three, OPCW perhaps seem, uh, has been a better treaty because uh, now I think uh, at least uh, on paper, all states have declared that they have uh, eliminated their stocks of uh, chemical weapons. And there is a, a mechanism uh, in the form of OPCW secretariat, et cetera, uh, to do surprise inspections and so on. Some kind of a verification is there. Although, of course, these treaties, as we have seen in probably Syria and other places, are being uh, 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 violated also. Now, the approach, one approach to deal with the WMD was, as I said, this uh, uh, non-proliferation through various uh, treaties. Another approach was that of arms control. And I think uh, Mr. Sanwan Khurshid mentioned uh, that uh, 1988, there was 1986, the uh, USSR and USA of that time, they signed an INF treaty, Intermediate a Nuclear Range a Force Treaty. Basically, it put a certain cap on uh, the uh, nuclear uh, the tipped missiles and also uh, on their deployment. That treaty has ended just a few months ago. Today, out of the various arms control treaties that were uh, negotiated during the Cold War years, only one is remaining. And that is called New START. That was uh, that will be finishing sometimes in uh, uh, 2021, which is next year. And the chances of that being uh, extended is very little. So, in fact, we are now entering into a new phase, an uncharted territory, where there would be no arms control treaty left. And it chances of a nuclear arms race is very uh, bright. And it is not a question of just, uh, you know, people say that, yes, earlier there used to be 70,000 uh, nuclear uh, weapons, and now they have come down to some um, 16,000 or something. That's not uh, very important. 16,000 still is uh, 16,000 too many. Not only that, 
today if you look at the national security doctrines of uh, whether it is uh, uh, russia whether it is usa they are spending trillions of dollars usa will be spending about a trillion dollar by 2030 to modernize their nuclear arsenal in fact the restraints which were put by the arms control treaties have gone and these same very countries who are part of the npt and they swear by npt they are the people who have made absolutely no uh, effort to stick by their commitment to nuclear disarmament under article 6 so you as a result you find that the nuclear uh, proliferation treaty npt non proliferation treaty is itself under a, a big crisis in fact for the last three sessions uh, they have these uh, review conferences every five years they have not been able to come up with any uh, agreed consensus document so that much for your npt and of course now we are entering into a new phase and uh, we are entering into a, a very uncertain world after covid and uh, again i think uh, the importance of biological weapons uh, and their proliferation has been uh, you know brought to focus by this but more important is the most important thing i think what covid has done is it has raised questions about the world order and i think uh, mr babat you also mentioned in the beginning about this uh, new world order uh, and globalization and you see globalization was another uh, vehicle because globalization has spread everything so why would it not spread the nuclear uh, weapon technologies also and they are all the dual use technologies so there are peaceful uh, uses also everybody would like to have uh, peaceful uh, uses of these technologies but be it chemical be it biological be it nuclear be it uh, now cyber and be it artificial intelligence and so on and so forth and all of them are dual use and they have uh, very uh, other uh, military uses also so the question before us now is that if you are having a new world order what is going to be the organizing principle of that new world order the fact is that over the last uh, since 1945 uh, the world order was based on principles which were dictated by the victors of the uh, second world war so that's why you had a very uh, uh, you know, flawed UN Security Council, which was exclusive rather than inclusive. UN is inclusive in everything else, but in this case, on international security, it became exclusivist. And as a result, uh, important countries were kept out, like India. And now you have a, uh, so you have a crisis of multilateralism. Same US, which went ahead and which uh, put so much energy into uh, putting the multilateral system in place, is now leaving it. It has uh, the World Health uh, Organization, for instance, WHO, the climate change, for instance. I mean, uh, it, it is leaving uh, the uh, several agencies or cutting its uh, the financing, etc. So multilateralism is in a big crisis. Today, to build any uh, consensus on any issue is becoming a very difficult. And of course, uh, today, uh, it's not just the states. But globalization has also uh, brought forth many non-state actors, and I'm not talking only of the terrorists, but even the NGOs or international NGOs, etc., who are following their own agenda-driven policies. They are interested in one agenda. If somebody is interested in climate change, he's not interested in population or something else, or just climate change. If somebody is interested in human rights, it's only human rights. So I think there is a certain fragmentation of the multilateral system. And the multilateral system itself is undergoing a crisis. And I think there is a crisis of the organizing principles. What is it? What do you want to prioritize? Do you want to prioritize war over peace or peace over war? So this is, I think, a very important uh, issue. And uh, I think uh, uh, probably you mentioned uh, in the beginning about uh, the number of uh, people who have died uh, in First World War and Second World War, etc. But I would urge you to see uh, a, a website uh, prepared by late uh, Professor Rommel, uh, and uh, it's called Demosite. He has calculated that over uh, the last many uh, centuries, the number of people who have died in because of 
the uh, you know this uh, in civil wars and famines and so many others reasons which are caused by the government is about 265 million and 20th century has been the bloodiest century recorded in the history and it is not that and more people have died outside the wars than in the wars and for reasons which are caused by men i'm not talking of the national uh, uh, natural disasters so uh, even after the end of the cold war we have seen that our uh, the civil wars have gone on africa has had many civil wars even as we speak uh, there is civil war in yemen there is civil war in um, syria and lakhs of people have died and of course now covid is taking its own toll we don't know where it will uh, end so i think uh, this violence which has been there this extreme uh, uh, lack of uh, morality in uh, international affairs because we all take pride in uh, the fact saying the international relations does not recognize any morality it is a realist uh, construct if it's a realist construct then the nuclear weapons and wmd etc i'm afraid are going to stay here so let me now come to uh, just a couple of points i think india and that is where the youth comes in firstly youth must take a realistic view of what is happening because you said uh, the definition of youth is uh, 15 to 24 15 to 24 years which means those who are 24 years they were born in about 94 95 96 around that time and these are the people now who will be taking charge increasingly over the, in the next uh, say uh, 10 years or so they will be in positions of uh, power and they will have a long life ahead of them so firstly first of all they must take account of where we are and all the mistakes that have been done earlier they must be rectified so i think the voice of youth is very important and ultimately our systems run not on somebody's uh, opinion but through a system whether it in india it's democracy democratic elections and the way we uh, you know send our people uh, to the parliament and these are the people who take uh, decisions and so on now all the system requires a big big change and i think the values that our uh, ancient indian wisdom has whether it is of vasudev kutumbakam living together uh, all these uh, you know, values caring for others uh, caring uh, for you see the extreme consumerism of the globalization has also alienated people i think this alienation must stop we must start thinking in terms of not just me but else uh, others also community values i think have to be uh, uh, also uh, talked about and brought back but essentially some morality in international relations has to be brought back i know it is very difficult i know it seems utopian but this is what i can say uh, to the youth of course this is an entirely new topic as to whether there is uh, i mean for a discussion a separate topic for discussion maybe you have discussed it i do not know in your previous sessions but uh, the youth has to start looking at uh, the situation and wherever the mistakes have been done they should raise their voice so we had the nuclear ban treaty for instance i'll just end with that now we had the nuclear ban treaty in 2017 because many countries were very upset that uh, this nuclear if you leave it to the nuclear have countries there will never be a nuclear convention so some countries got together and under a unga resolution they passed a nuclear uh, ban treaty uh, i think once 50 countries ratify it this will become uh, uh, operational but 50 countries have not yet ratified it and i think uh, there is uh, one must think why why is it that all the countries who have signed it have not yet uh, ratified it because moment there is uncertainty in the world there will be nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction so we must bring down the uncertainty and the real cause is that we are not really uh, cooperating with each other and i think our own uh, wisdom of indian uh, civilization has any number of uh, ways which tells you uh, that how to live uh, peacefully harmoniously maintain harmony uh, and uh, treat the other person the way you would like to treat yourself these are the things i think that they must come back in our uh, discourse of the youth and not just uh, jobs not just uh, livelihood issues not just uh, uh, you know uh, a, a consumerism we must the youth has to rise above you see we have to really invent a new uh, movement just as during the freedom struggle all the youth got together and they are the people 
who sacrifice their uh, uh, young lives or their times and to uh, keep the uh, the uh, british out i think that kind of a movement has to start and uh, good luck to you so thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much uh, for those inputs thank you very much for putting in uh, so many uh, aspects and so many things uh, to for everyone in the audience we have almost 343 people live listening to this uh, dialogue thank you very much for that and now let me take the privilege to introduce you to the next uh, eminent speaker of this session the president of international council of for control of iodine deficiency disorders and former professor of aims new delhi dr chandrakant pandavji uh, uh pandav sir uh, yes i can see you thank you just a minute i have some technical glitch i suppose thank you Dr. Chandrakant Pandav is the former professor and head center for community medicine at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Ames, New Delhi. Presently, he's the member of National Council on India Nutrition Challenges under Poshan Abhiyan, which is chaired by the vice chairman of Niti Aayog. For his career commitment to successful universal uh, salt iodization and iodine deficiency control program, he is known as the IOT man of India. In year 2017, as he has been recognized by the World Health Organization as a public health champion, he is a recipient of many national and international awards. Dr. Pandav has written 12 books on health sciences and published over 400 research papers. Thank you very much, sir, for joining in here today with us. And uh, without taking much time, because we have left somewhere around 10 to 12 minutes, uh, I hand over the charge to you. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a film that leads to these. I want to show you a film. Can you ask the team to? Could I have the film, please? Uh, technical team, could you please play the film, sir? Is asking about. Elegi, sir, ek film ke baare mein keh rahe hai. can you please play the film? Uh, you're not getting the audio of the film. Uh, I think we can, you're not getting the audio. Okay, if there are problems with technology, we can yeah we can move forward thank you sir okay uh, there's a new syndrome called technology anxiety syndrome technology anxiety yes and one of the ways i've learned to overcome this technology adversity is i got a new degree which was since i understand recently started by world peace university called not be calm, but be calm, be calm. So the, the entire story that I'm going to share with you is moving around the stillness of mind, Manashan. That's the internal resilience, which is so vital to deal with any kind of warfare, any kind of warfare. Corona is one of the simplest warfare to deal with. Very simple. But before that, I'm also learning the, relearning the alphabets of life. 
E, F, G, and H. H these days, the attention is focused on the high quality of life, high quality. And G, I say, gratitude, gratitude. And F is for forgiveness. So before I start, I want to express my gratitude to my colleagues, the team of physicians, the doctors, the nurses, the paraprofessional staff, the ward boys, the sweepers, sanitary workers, drivers, in law and enforcement authorities, and anybody who is involved with this story of dealing with corona globally, I would just like to say, express my deep gratitude. This morning, I am very, very proud to know that two of the ladies from my institution, my SMIT, have also taken equal amount of sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Uh, Dr. Suchitra Karad, she has invited, she invited, she went to the state government that my hospital and Talega, I would like to be identified as a hospital we would like to serve, to use the word serve and not treat, treat the COVID-19 patients. Aditi Karar in her own way is extending similar kind of sympathy, empathy, and compassionate service. So along with my other colleagues, two ladies of the house, let me express my gratitude. So the, my story, if you look at it, it's a very interesting story because it is beautifully with your topic, the role of United Nations agencies in terms of finding any emergency. And in this case, is the corona emergency. Uh, before proceeding, I would like to express my deep gratitude to Professor Dr. Vishwanath Karad for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this exciting national conference. I had a chance to be part of it. It's very extremely motivating. A lot of introspection is there. And that's what I've learned for the last uh, 70, 80 days. Uh, Dr. Karar knows that I was a compulsory traveler. Traveling 200 days out of 365. Unsteady mind, unsteady physique. But these 80 days have been a days of enlightenment for me. I begin to look at events in totally different perspective. And the life is all about perspective. Because uh, you're in the information age, in the information you translate knowledge. In order to translate to knowledge, you have to gain some skills, what we call as panning for the goal. Knowledge is necessary, but not sufficient. You've got to have an experience. When you have knowledge and experience, it leads to wisdom. There are two kinds of people in this world, those who are wise and those who are otherwise. India has a third category, those who supervise. You know, it's a very unique uh, cultural trait in us. You employ two people, there is one to supervise. So this wisdom is the one which determines the influence on attitude. attitude. And the whole story of this entire exercise, be it biological warfare, corona warfare, chemical warfare, nuclear warfare, any unfair thing is depending upon the attitude, attitude of people. It's the attitude which determines your behavior. And the repeated behavior leads to practice. So that is the story. The alphabets of life starts with information, knowledge, experience. Wisdom, attitude, behavior, and practice. So let's look at the attitude part. A lot of people are considering that this corona is a problem, big problem. Those who have matured consider every problem and obstacle as an opportunity in life, not to grow outwardly, but to grow inwardly. That's what I mean by internal resilience, active by external. So some of the simple rules of handling the problems are you expect them, you anticipate them, 
you face the problem, keep a proper perspective, most important, learn from them, share the learning, and store the learning. We very poor at documentation. Now, when you look at the psychoanalysis of this entire history of corona, two things come up. One is the peace, other is the power. There is one group of individuals, nations who are in pursuit of peace, and I'm very proud my mother India is at the epicenter of this pursuit of peace, Vishwa Shanti. My association with Miles MIT, Vishwa Shanti, I think has brought epigenetic changes in all of us. I just want to tell the young students that you are very, very blessed to have this degree of deep calm, to have exposed to stillness of mind, which will give stability to your action. So I was coming to peace and power. My Indian tradition focuses on a journey that will lead to self-actualization and self-realization. While those who are in pursuit of power, whether it be financial power, military power, uh, biological warfare, chemical warfare, political power, are the ones which China has chosen in today's context. It's all about power game. I mean, they have so much land, still they want to spend their time in fighting with us at, at Gulwan. So this power gives an opportunity to have control for your shadrupu, anger, ego, greed, lust, and jealousy, hatred. That's, that's the alphabet. That's why I said the central theme of my thing is alphabet. So why is this necessary for China to do all this? It's all power, related power. And especially China with the history, so much of market was Indian. And everything is made in China. You'll be surprised to know that the flags of the United States of America are made by the prisoners in China, made by the prisoners in China. And apparently, this virus, Corona, is also made in China. We don't know it's made in China or manufactured in China. That's a question that is to be under, understood. So what I'm saying is that this is the, my main message to all of you. My culture believes in Shanti, Shanti Dut. The culture on the other side of the Himalayas believes in Shanti Dut. We are tolerant to Akraman. They are very fond of Akraman. Hum log gunwan hai, wo pehlwan hai. Now, the second part of my story is that I have a very long association with China. I was very blessed to, to get an entry in the International World Health Organization and UNICEF at the age of 28 years. I first visited China in 85, and I have traveled extensively, met a lot of people, right from the grassroots worker to the chairman of the Communist Party of China, way back in 1990. In fact, I must proudly share with you that uh, the current program of iodine deficiency control program in China, which is a successful program, I was the team leader that wrote the policy and the program way back in 19. China, when you look at it, two distinct categories. There is the government and there is the party. Government is sits in the great hall of the people, and the party sits in the inner forbidden city. And the party consists of five people. So actual decision makers is the party, council of five people. Our program on ideal deficiency was not moving fast enough. You know. So it's important to understand the political economy of any country. So I insisted that we would like to be the party, party leaders. But we had to please, you know, 
and ultimately I took on a fast. Gandhiji's way of adopting and interacting. Next day, we were invited to the Pillar Forbidden City, where the Communist Party chairman, Mr. Zhu Rongji, was there with our fellow members. When we met them, he asked us questions. Uh, why are you so interested in this problem of identity in Florida? What's happening in the United States of America? He said, I'm a minister of finance also. Why should I be interested in this? And third thing, my party's program, poverty elevation, poverty elevation. How is my investment in this program going to help poverty elevation? I had a chance to meet many world leaders in my lifetime kings and princes, queens and presidents and prime minister. When you meet the world leaders, you never get a second chance to make the first impression. You really have to be very smart. To answer his first question, I told him, it's a global problem. It's a geological problem. As the age of glaciation, 10,000 years, reached the iodine from the surface of the soil. That's why I saw it in the and what is going on the soil is identity. Second question, he said, I'm Minister of Finance. Why should I be interested? He was asking the question of cost benefit. Fortunately, I had in 1991 gone to the McMaster University in Canada and did my health economics. And I wrote my thesis called Yes, a worthwhile investment. I mean, I got a gold medal in the process. Oxford University Press decided published my thesis and published 1,000 copies. So I knew the numbers in, around the tip of my fingers. If you give $1 in, you'll get $10 back. But if you include the effects related to education, livestock, you will give $30 back. One is to 30. But today's new, new methodologist said it's one is to 80. Extremely beneficial program, worthwhile investment. Third question. I'm sorry, extremely sorry to interrupt, sir, but we have uh, running yeah, short yeah. of time. Yeah, sorry. Oh, Thank sure. you. I'm at towards the end. Actually, I already given my message that basically it was related to the the perception of how you look at the, the recognizing the problem and how you solve it. But I'm just telling you the story very quickly. The third was poverty elevation. I said this is linked with the brain development. So he came out outside. I have the photographs meeting about 400 governors, chief ministers, they were there. And he said that this morning I had the opportunity to meet the world leaders. And I'm prepared as a minister of finance and the premier of China to commit any resources to eliminate this problem. At this point, I was responsible for raising $100 million. And a matter of five years, the program was eliminated. But why is it eliminated? They're also doing well. Because the, if you look at the governance structure of China, there is no democracy. There is a dictatorship. And there is enforcement by the People's Liberation Army, which were also equally active in Wuhan as well. People who are associated with authority things have disappeared in the first four weeks after they had done their contribution to making of this virus. So, friends, what I want to say is that remember, in life, there is always something else about what you understand and what you know. I just want to re-emphasize that you people are blessed enough to be in a unique educational environment where there's a focus in terms of not only information gathering, not only knowledge, but you are being exposed to reality. And a lot of wise people are teaching you so that you can have a change in attitude, practice, and behavior. That's all life is about. That tells you about the perspective. I'm sure there'll be opportunities to have the written paper on this because I have a lot of interesting stories to share with you. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much. And looking at the paucity of time, I would request my technical team to quickly take us to the passing of resolution. 
I request my technical team if they could please relay the uh, resolution on screen so that we can take it. I'm sorry, my friends, I'll not be able to take the question and answer round in this session because we have actually passed the time almost. Uh, okay, so here comes the resolution. We, the participants at the International Conference on Eradication of Biological and Chemical Weapons, uh, congratulate Government of India for ensuring unopposed uh, election of India to non as a non-permanent seat uh, to United Nations Security Council and urge the government on behalf of the youth to utilize this opportunity to strengthen UNSC's capacities to eliminate the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, uh, the, the resolution is now open for voting. I request my technical team to open the uh, polling process. Yes, the, the voting is on. I request everyone in the audience, everyone in the panel to please uh, use your device and click on yes if you support the resolution and click on no if you do not. It is our sincere, sincere urge to the government uh, to utilize this opportunity to strengthen UNSC's capacities to eliminate uh, WMDs. Uh, we have very less time in hand, 30 seconds have passed, so half time is uh, already over. I request everyone to please use this time quickly and cast your vote. Last few seconds, my friends, I'm sure you have done the process of voting. Three, two, one, and the time is up, my friends. Uh, I request my technical team to display the results so that I can share it with everyone. If uh, we may see the result uh, on screen, please. Uh, oh, yes, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Everyone again who has voted has voted for the resolution. Thank you very much for passing this resolution. Thank you everyone in the audience. Thank you everyone in the panel. And now it is indeed my honor and privilege uh, to request our beloved founder, Honorable Professor Dr. Vishwanath Karat, sir. If, uh, no okay, okay, sure, sir. Thank you. Uh, I request uh, Group Captain uh, DP Apte, sir, uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor of MIT World Peace University, if uh, he would like to give the concluding remarks and vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, it was indeed a very interesting session where all the four speakers analyzed the role of UN in eliminating weapons of mass destruction, all the treaties and how they are, why they are not working, these particular treaties. We also, panelists also said that uh, in last century had seen more destruction Anyway, uh, not because of natural calamities, but all man-made issues. Also, the point came up that we should have priority of peace over war instead of priority of war over peace. That is very important because many civil wars and many other issues have created uh, very sufferings to the mankind. And also the point came up that Indian civilization has got a lot of answers for the world. And Indian civilization can really guide the world for this particular mess what we are in. And for that, youth should put up enough pressure on their governments and in turn to the United Nations Security Council as well as the World Health Organization to pick up the threat from coexistence of the entire universe, the global family. Thank you very much, Dr. This Honorable Sir, uh, Salman Bhutchiji had spoken very analytical and detailed description of nuclear weapons as such. Then uh, Sri Arvind Guptaji has given a very uh, candid way because he knows how the different governments are functioning and nitty gritties of their functioning of United Nations. And he has actually brought the point that unless priority is given to this subject, why this uh, other countries, uh, some of the countries will not follow it. And uh, uh, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sri Arvind Gupaji. Then our Dr. Chandrakan Pointer, he has ex shared his experience. He's also shared experience with the, uh, how China cooperated uh, 
and actually we feel that China is presently not cooperating, but they cooperated uh, for this uh, international or UN resolution at that time for iodine and all that. So it is possible that if it is convinced, those people are convinced that it is beneficial for humanity, it is possible to change. So thank you very much, Dr. Chandragan Pandav. I also I thank uh, Jasmine Mehta for uh, her words. I have personally, again, one important one. I thank our founder, President of the Vishnu Karat. He is through to every session. He is sitting there and participating and expressing his thoughts also. Now, due to the positive time uh, to share his views. Thank you very much sir, for having this wonderful idea. And we are coming almost to the culmination. Next session is a validatory session and very important topic of eradication of biological and chemical weapons. It will go a long way and it will be written. This particular conference will be written in the history that the beginning of some change in this direction. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gupta ji. Thank you very much, Pandav ji. Thank you much, uh, very much, everyone in the panel. Thank you very much for uh, joining in. Uh, with this, we have reached the end of this particular session. And yes, as uh, rightly Apte sir said, that the next, and that is the valedictory session of this four-day international conference on eradication of biological and chemical weapons would be starting in a few minutes from now. That is at 6 p.m. sharp, in which we are going to have many, many dignitaries on the dais, uh, Advocate Anand Mathurji, we would be having group captain Dr. Ajay Leliji. We would be having Professor Francis Boyle. We would also be having with us Dr. Rajendra Shinde. We would be having Colonel G. H. R. Naidu. And of course, uh, join hands with uh, UNESCO chairholder, our beloved founder, Professor Dr. Vishwanath Karatsa. Thank you very much for joining in and see you back uh, again at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>